Usually everyone has tons of tech questions, so we're going to kind of jump right in. First of all, uh, we're joined here by Sarah O'Donnell from uh, AverageBetting.com. We're da uh, joined by Diane Koo, right? Right, okay, from um, WhiteOnRicePeople.com. Sandy McKenna from MidlifeRoadTrip.com. John Treefry, ooh, got it, okay, uh, from DocsDoc, Doc, and myself, Douglas E. Welch at DouglasEWelch.com. Doc, Doc, woo, give me a woo woo. Um, we're gonna kind of dive into this. Most of you are already producing stuff, and I'm just gonna open it up. Who's got the first question? Anybody? That's a, you know what is well, this? This is a short panel. <laughs> Tech questions? Okay, I have a question for all of you then. Do you have one? Yes. How does Doc Doc relate to food? Good question. Um, I actually, <laughs> formerly, uh, I was uh, at Mahalo, and I did, uh, I produced cooking content for them. Um, I produced somewhere in the range of 500 cooking videos for them. Wow. So, um, yeah, that's why I'm here. And Mahalo is? Mahalo is a how-to um, uh, site that produces all sorts of different um, how-to video and article. And that's on Docstock? No, no, no. That's no, unrelated. Okay. Unrelated. Okay. So, yeah, the, that's just my former company. Got it. Yeah. I saw a hand back here, didn't I? Yes, in the back. Shout it out. Have an idea. Have an idea. Have an idea. Okay. How about, well, and that's, like, you see me carrying around my little analog collection device today? That's where I note every idea that pops into my head about videos. Um, when you first started, how did you jump in? How did you do your first video? How did you do your first audio? I drank a lot of wine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to, to answer your question in one statement, um, food on the table, because that's how I refer to people by their Twitter handles. Um, one of my favorite bands right now is Tame Impala. If you haven't heard of them, check them out if you like rock and roll. Um, when, they, when they were asked why they started producing music and how they got their band started, they said, we create music that we want to hear. Create the cooking show that you want to watch. That's it's, it's that's always great advice. Create what you want, you what you yourself want to watch. Solve a problem that you yourself want solved. Okay. Hi. Um. You know, for me, I, I started. I'm a professional photographer, and I've been photographing for years. And I just started a blog as a creative space. And um, I really hadn't dived into video yet. I, it was something that I always loved to do. So one of the first videos that we put up was just something really random. But one subject or theme that we never forgot and always made sure we instilled in every video is making sure you tell a story. I think that's very, very, very important. And that's become the, it's become the mantra and the kind of the philosophy behind our blog. And from that, each video that we put up, we wanted to put up that was something that was very meaningful to us. So whenever we wrote, um, did a video about a story or garden or anybody within the food community, we never thought about what we were gonna do in the video. We always wanted to make sure what the story was who the people were, and what really drove us to want to connect with them so much. So each of the videos that we did always had a story, and from that, um, it got a lot of attention. Like, the quality of the videos were not anything professional. The audio was really bad, but we wanted to make sure that there was a story behind it. And from that place, and how we produce video and how we find content, is what's brought us now to be able to produce videos for major brands, publications, and a lot of things that, you know, are very, very important to us. So again. For us, it's about finding the story first. Important note about what you just said. You learn as you go. The first one will look like absolute trash. And you will put it out anyway. You understand? You will put it out anyway because it's how you get started. And every one you do, you learn a little bit more. Just real quick, any comments from John? Or yeah, I, I have a few uh, comments. More on the technical side. Um, I'm sure nobody here lacks inspiration. Uh, one thing that I have been really excited about is um, ever since uh, Google released what was called Panda um, earlier this spring, which was like a reorganization, there's like a really um, big emphasis on expert content. And one thing that I learned um, producing a lot of cooking content was um, sort of a three-pronged approach to really uh, rate your, your content very highly in the search engines, which was uh, video, photo, and um, expert articles. So if you use those three um, tools together, your posts will rank really high in search. 
and um, to um, to that effect, uh, you know, a lot of people like Diane, um, you know, photography people or video people um, now are kind of coming together through uh, DSLRs, uh, which can shoot photo and video. So uh, for a lot of people in the blog space, I think that's um, a really good low low cost and um, high quality way to produce um, both video content and uh, photos. And for us it was about embracing who you are. Uh, we would leave in the outtakes and that's really what we've been become known for is our outtakes. People enjoy those as much as they do our actual videos. People so. love behind the scenes information no matter where it comes from, no matter how big or how small you are, they like to peek behind the curtain. I find that everywhere I go, the people, that's one of the first things they mention, is, oh, that was so funny when you bapped yourself in the head with that. You know, so if we can be a little amusing for other people's uh, amusement, I guess that's okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> to reiterate, kind of add on what John, John said, oh, well, um, it's important when you put up multimedia content, it ha you have to surround that content with great words. We're still not at a point where Google or any of the search engines can accurately translate voice text. So if you don't surround your video or your photo with words, there is no way the search engines can find you. Okay? So please be sure to write show notes, write a description about the photo or how you took the photo, what the photo meant to you. Surround it with words so the search engines can find you. A couple questions. One about the photo. Um, on WordPress, when you put a photo up, it asks you to put tags in, but you can't, you don't see that text on the screen. Is Google, is it, are they able to search that file name or just what's on the text on the web? Um, <coughs> typically that's an alt tag. An alt tag is a piece of text. It's also very useful for people with vision impairments because when they point at a picture, it'll actually describe, it'll read that alt tag to them, so it's also important for that, but it's also another piece of information that gets sucked up by the search engines. So you, do you guys use alt tags? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I tend to be real lazy about it, but. I do alt tags, but I also, um, what we do is we, for best SEO, we um, label when we upload, before you even bring it into there, we upload with keywords on that photo. So that Google will read that, when it uploads, it uploads that original file, and then we further key tag and we, um, yeah, we were talking about, they were talking about tagging before, and just, again, you got to get those words out there so that the search engines can find them. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know about editing software for dummies. <laughs> what do you guys use? Let's just run through the gamut. Or video. 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 So, um, personally, um, I use Final Cut Pro, which uh, is made by Apple. Um, it is a professional level software, um, however, there was a new version released called uh, Final Cut 10, uh, which is um, a, a lot easier to use. I would recommend that uh, to really streamline software. Um, if you're really low tech, um, something and like cheap. and cheap, um, Final Cut is actually like only three hundred dollars. Super cheap. So um, <laughs> there, there is a there is a version called Final Cut Express, right. which I have, and it's about a hundred and fifty mm. or hundred. And if and you work for a and if you go to a college, you, and you can go to the college bookstore and often pick it up for even cheaper if you have a... a, a I think for super cheap, because I use Final Cut Pro and it's like $1,600, and it's, there's a big learning curve for Final Cut Pro. And if you haven't really dived into video, but you really want to, um, keep it simple and always focus on the content and the story, but don't negate simple tools that you have, which I use as a personal project, and that's my iPhone. I work on a personal project now with an iPhone, and it gets, gets, gets great results. But I film everything on my iPhone, and for editing on the iPhone, um, it's a $4.99 app for iPhone 4, and it's called iMovie. See that? And, and that's a great app if you have an iPhone. If you don't, um, there's, uh, if you have a Mac, there's iMovie that usually comes free as part of the package when you buy that Mac. Yeah, that's and typically yeah. what most people are running into is yes. you're getting iMovie free on a Mac. Unfortunately, there's really not a good alternative for Windows. There is a Windows Movie Maker, but boy, is it rough around the edges. Right. You'll get something out of it, but... Wow, it's, it's, it's ugly for a beginning program. And, and you know, iMovie on the desktop for a Mac is fantastic. I mean, the new version, you can do so much stuff. God, it's, it's fantastic. Okay. And Final Cut X is very much a kind of a combination of iMovie and Final Cut. It has a lot of the power of Final Cut, but it has a lot of the interface of iMovie, which is 
simpler for the average person to use. It ticked off a bunch of editors because it removes some of the power features, but for you and I, it's a nice way of going forward with that. Anything else on editing? Yeah, yes. just, um, yeah, I produced the first 40 episodes of Average Betty on using iMovie right out of the box, you know, but it was already loaded. Uh, we switched to Final Cut Express, which is like $150. The learning curve from iMovie to, iMovie to Final Cut is not too extreme. However, if you go to YouTube and you type in, you can, they'll, people will show you videos. They will walk you through just about anything that you want to do. Um, obviously, Photoshop for photo editing, um, you can get the elements and all of those types of versions. And then um, GarageBand, which is also another thing which... Um, for you know, audio. Yeah, yeah, for audio, equalizing sound and all that. Um, but is anyone here familiar with Chef John of Food Wishes? Um, well, you should be, especially if you're interested in creating online video. He has never strayed from like iMovie, you know, BC. I don't even know what version of iMovie he's using, but he found something that works for him. He's able to produce his content, and I think that's the most important thing. Find the application that works best for you. You'll eventually find that a piece of software will roll off the end of the life cycle, though. iMovie HD is probably what he's using, and if he upgrades to Lion, the newest operating system, it will no longer work. <laughs> so there will be a panic on his. So don't, don't fall too far behind. Um, you don't need to upgrade to every, everything, but try to stay within two or three versions of the current version. Uh, just a touch, there is a uh, free editing application <laughs> called Lightworks. Lightworks was the application that was used for the base edit of Keen Speech. So it is a, it's very feature rich in its own way. It is free. It's technically a beta, but it still works very well. So that is an option. It's on cross platform. Lightworks.com? I think so. But the name of the application is Lightworks. If you Google it, it should show up very quickly. We'll, we'll get that for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so Lightworks. So technically, um, on the technical side, I'm actually a television editor, but I, don't you already know what you need to know. I do, but I don't actually ever export to the web. I mean, there are people who do that for me. But at home, what, what compression do you use to get the web, the video to play properly on the internet? I have all this written down. You want me to rattle it off? Sure. Yeah, okay. just So if you want to encode or publish your video to YouTube um, from a QuickTime yeah. format via Final Cut, this is exactly what I publish in. Um, H264, high quality, and we publish in 640 by 360. Uh, sound, you want the setting to say ACC stereo 128 bit, 44.1 kilohertz. And the end result you'll get is a dot move file. Our videos are about three to four minutes long and they're usually under 100 megabytes which is, for a lot of sites, that's the cap-off point. I think YouTube is, has raised it up to like 300 now. But um, TubeMogul was brought up. Uh, love TubeMogul. And uh, they have a big uploader. So you can just go right to TubeMogul, do your one upload. We always put it in this uh, format, and it'll go off to Dailymotion, to YouTube, to wherever it needs to go. Encoding for iTunes is a little bit different. For me, I, if you're using iMovie, it's literally, you know, it's for, for YouTube, big. It's kind of the choices you get, and that's for to iTunes, big, HD, and that's, that's pretty much it. From Final Cut, you normally, I actually use a separate program, I dump it out, it's a really big move file right out of uh, Final Cut, it says, you know, export to QuickTime Movie, and I use a piece of software called MPEG Stream Clip, kind of a funky name, but M-P-E-G Stream R-E-A-M clip, C-L-I-P dot com. Uh, actually, uh, do a search on that. I believe it's um, squared.com is the website. What it has is a nice iTunes preset, and you say, take that movie, make it for iTunes big. <laughs> and it spits out a nice 100 to 200 megabyte file, depending upon the length, and it's really easy to do. Anybody else? I've got a question for Sandy. So, iMovie, you... Anything else on export? Uh, I swear by MPEG Stream Clip. It's a great, it's a free uh, download. I think it's really good. It's a little more advanced, but again, you know, you can search YouTube if you don't know how to use it. Um, really powerful software that's free. And I use the, I use the presets. I mean, that's what I use it for. Yes. A question for Sandy. I don't, your your site is midlife 
roadtrip.tv. I'm, yes. I'm just going to assume that you're actually uploading on the road. Do you? Yes. So do you just go from that? How do you do it? We have laptops. We, we carry Max with us. And Rick Griffin, who is my co-host, he's a brilliant editor. So he, he can edit anywhere. Diane, are you uploading directly from the iPhone for your projects? You mentioned that using the iPhone. Yeah, well, when I do, um, if I direct um, upload directly, I usually will edit on my iPhone or through iMovie. But um, on a project that I'm working on, I actually import it into Final Cut Pro. And then I use it on YouTube. And by the way, this is where the world's headed, by the way. It's amazing. Um, mobile is the next big leap. It's what everyone's moving to. You have to remember, people are going to be watching your stuff on these screens, maybe on an iPad. But they're taking your content with you into the kitchen. Most particularly, uh, they'll set up the iPad on the counter and they'll watch you do the recipe and they'll do it along with you. So it's definitely something to think about. You're shooting your videos, make sure you get those close-ups, make sure you show the details because it might be on a screen this big. Okay. Next question, yes sir. I think the new YouTube browser-based tool is going to be the kind of the state of the art right now. I forget who makes that. Liam, do you remember? Uh, do you remember who made that new? They're just including it this week, literally. Yeah. The other the other web-based editors are kind of clunky because you have to upload all your footage first, which means you're uploading a lot more than you really need to upload because you're going to end up trimming that down. Uh, I edit on a on my computer almost exclusively. You guys? Same. Yeah. Uh, Ninety-five percent of the time is. Computer and, and did I hear right? You're using iMovie on your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. iMovie. It's four ninety nine app. Yeah, it's actually an, it's a it's a mini version of iMovie for your iPhone. So you can actually grab your video, snip it down, do whatever thing you want with it, title it. Um, and, and immediately uploads to YouTube. Yeah. The rendering time is fantastic. It's yeah. like five minutes. Very cool. In the back. There's some other sources too that I can give you. Right. The other question is, um, I know how important good sound is, but when you're at home and you don't have a lot of mic, what do you do? Like, just make sure you're close to the microphone. Like, what, what, what are the things that you guys do to make this sound? So, so um, actually, there's a uh, little device up here. Um, it's actually uh, called an H1 recorder. Um, it's uh, made by Zoom. Um, I personally use an H4N, which is like a little higher end. It's about three hundred dollars, but you can um, you can plug a wireless lav mic into that, um, and it also has onboard mics. Um, so obviously, like a, a wireless lav is going to be your best uh, option for your host. And you can get a non-wireless version of one of those for like sixty-nine bucks. Sure. They're really inexpensive. Sure. You can plug it into any recorder you can use, sure. even plug it into your computer. Sure. Radio Shack sells. Yeah, Radio yeah. Shack sells one for like thirty dollars, and I started off with the twenty nine ninety nine one, and it worked great. It worked great. The other point is getting close. Even if you're recording on your Mac microphone, if that's all you've got, just get close and speak in a normal tone of voice. Um, another microphone I use is called a Blue Snowball. There's other microphones like this. They're USB microphones. They plug right into your computer. They don't require a mixing board or cables or anything else. You literally plug it in with what looks like a USB printer cable. It shows up in GarageBand or in iMovie or in Final Cut, and it's a high quality condenser mic like they use in radio stations and everything else, like you sound very good. And um, again, very inexpensive. Uh, that one's, I think, $60, $60, and they have a variety of different versions that beyond Blue's products as well. And these, these just connect with like, your low budget HD cams, or is this? Yes. And, well, your standard connectors are going to be your 8th inch headphone jack connector, or you're going to have USB for the case. Um, or perhaps a quarter inch. Anything like that you can adapt easily to your computer, to a recorder, anything you got. I wear, typically if I'm doing a stand-up, like today my camera is way over there. I have the little recorder here that's recording us for closer audio. If I'm doing a stand-up, I'll actually wear um, lavalier mics plugged into a little recorder in my pocket, and then I sync them up later. Now I do want to say, and perhaps you can enlighten me on this too, I believe 
audio is more than 50% of your video. Do you find that? Yeah, we agree. If, if they can't hear what you're saying. They'll forgive a lot of ugly video yeah. if they can hear you. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Serena touched on this in the last panel, but uh, you know, I would invest in audio over video, actually. Absolutely, I would too. That little flip cam does a tremendously good job. I'm surprised every time I use it. Uh, the iPhone, same quality, basically, does a great job. You'd really be surprised, especially if you've got plenty of light. Um, the quality for the cost is, is amazing. Next question. Yes. Um, I do. If I get a big national count of a big client, I definitely what we call color grade. You know, in photo editing, you edit a photo, but in video, we call it color grade. So we do use different um, um, different software and different plugins in Final Cut Pro to color grade. But yes, it does help. We do because we shoot in a lot of different locations, and at, in the end, I mean, you get a lot of different color in a lot of different places. So. You want to you want to match clip to clip exactly. so that it doesn't you know change color all over the place. Um, do you carry a gray card, a 50% gray card, a white card? How do you? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a card. There's a, a is it a 50% gray? I can't remember. Yeah. And there's I just typically I'll use a piece of white paper. I'll just stand in front of the camera and kind of do this. Once you have a known white value in your editing program, you can say that's white. Make everything else look right, and that'll at least give you a basic a basic balance between all your clips. You may notice this when you watch videos that the, you know the color balance will be in and out. Uh, it doesn't disturb people too much, honestly. Not that I find. Yeah, I kind of recommend for like uh, you know people who aren't really familiar with that just to stick with the presets in your camera and just make sure that you're using the same presets. Like usually there's like a daylight and an indoor balance. Like if you're not super familiar with color grading, then I would just say make sure that you're shooting in a consistent um, setting across like all your clips. And you may see a white balance setting on your camera that allows you to say this is tungsten, this is fluorescent light. They all have different colors. Fluorescent's kind of bluish and tungsten's kind of orange. And the only time I fiddle with that in my camera is if I notice in the viewfinder that it's like really orange, I'll go, ah, okay, I need to adjust that and I'll fix it. Um, I'll take it a little further. A lot of new cameras, the DSL, uh, DSLR cameras now have what's called the Kelvin scale. And you can take that further. You have the presets, but there's actually what's called a Kelvin scale. It measures the temperature of light. So you can further define the white balance by going up and down to measure and balance out the temperature of the light within your shooting environment. That makes sense. That actually brings up a great issue. Do you guys find yourself going down the rabbit hole at all when you're working on your videos? Do you know what I mean? can just never get things. Yeah, you, going down the rabbit hole, as Alice in Wonderland reference of, oh, if I just tweak that just a little bit more and then I change that just a little, and you end up three hours later, you wake up and <laughs> for your three minute video. Do you guys have a problem with that at all? I do, but I'm, a, I'm really <laughs> anal retentive with light. I'm a photographer, so anywhere I go, I have to make sure my light is on. So before we even do a shoot, I make sure my light balance is on and everything. Because it saves an editing time. I'm not an editor. I don't want to spend my life editing. I want to produce content. I want to tell stories. So I want to make sure everything's spot on, at least as close to good. Yeah, I mean, the way I describe it to people, because my job as a, someone who helps people do new media stuff is to get them started. The biggest problem I find with people is getting them moving, because they start to freak out about all these, oh, i got to make sure my white balance is right, my audio is perfect, and everything has to be perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect is the enemy of good. If you want everything to be perfect, you will never produce a video because you will just constantly be paralyzed. Did that happen to you guys at all? Well, I think that um, you know when you are going out into the field, it, make a checklist. Mm -hmm. You know, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? There is nothing worse than coming home with like a blue Jada de Laurentiis or something. You know, you've set your, <laughs> you've set your white balance for something that happened, you know, 20 minutes prior. Then you're starstruck. You forget to reset your white balance, everybody's blue. It's not a good thing. So you, every time you, before you push record, go through these steps and, you, you know. And learn how, to default your, learn how to default your camera back, too. There's usually a quick way to say, you know, power it off and on, or just to say, I know I did that before. Let's just go back to the beginning. Um, that brings up an interesting question. How many people are on your shoot? I mean, here in LA, we're used to hundreds of people you know, following people around, doing their makeup and everything else. How many people do you have when you go out and do a video? We usually have two. And that's 
we do everything from start to finish. And which brings up a good point that where if you had uh, 50 people on a set, you would have many cameras and be able to do many things. You can do a lot with one camera. It just takes a lot longer. Because you have to do shot after yeah, shot. You, you know, you don't want, you take um, a close up, a mid range, and then um, far away. So uh, you always want to have several shots. And you can do it with one camera. Yeah, I mean, crews can be super small. I actually shot a ton of content with uh, Christina Vanning here for uh, Recipe.com. And, um, you know, we literally had, um, you know, two crew and a host. And, you know, we're able to produce an enormous amount of content. And uh, one thing I wanted to kind of touch on was um, a, lot of, a lot of this whole process of creating cooking content has to do with preparation. And not just, like, with your equipment, but it's also in terms of, like, mise en place like isn't just for chefs it really like makes a difference when you're producing like a, a recipe on camera um, and to that end I would also recommend uh, if you're doing a recipe prepare it beforehand so that you know going forward like how to you know m like beat the egg whites or whatever it is that's that's going on and then what you can also get by that is if you have um, if you have like a hero you know, roast or something that you've made ahead of time, you don't have to wait for that to actually cook. You can just, in your production process, when you're like, okay, I'm going to put the, the roast in the oven here, you can pull out a finished one. You're giving away all the secrets of food, food shows. <laughs> I'll, I'll give them all the way. I'll give them all the way. And B-roll, that's, that's really important. That will be your friend. Do you know what B-roll is? Is that the term familiar to most people? Yeah, okay, because, you know, B-roll is basically that footage you take that is not, not the person standing in front of you giving the recipe. It's the shot of the food, it's a shot of the kitchen, it's the shot of them walking down the, the street. street. Yeah, B-roll is great because B-roll is always something to cut to. So, especially if you're on a one camera shoot, you don't have a lot of coverage. B-roll is awesome because if your host makes a mistake, you need to cut away, you can cut up, you know, cut into a close up um, or, you know, a, de a shot of your, one of your ingredients or something like that. So I highly recommend get a lot of B-roll. Yeah, you can cover up a lot of sins with B-roll. <laughs> Someone flubs a word during, during an interview or a stand-up, you can basically excise that word, but you need to cut away from them while you cut that little piece out of the video. So that's what you slap some B-roll in there to cover that up. We have time for one more question. Yes. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot of content online. You can go on YouTube. It's a great resource. All you do is Google it, and there's always some tutorial. But I think really the best way to learn, and that's how I learned, is to partner up with somebody. Partner up with somebody and go out. You know how you go out and you have lunch? Why don't you spend two hours and photograph with somebody? Produce a video. Work together. Encourage each other. Support each other to work out, throw out all those creative and technical things that you might come across. To me, it's always better to learn with two people who support each other. And that's the best class to me, because you can have access to that way more than having to travel for a workshop somewhere. So take the time, maybe an hour a week, partner up with somebody and just learn. There's a thing called photo walks. You'll see them advertised all the time in LA and all over the world. Group of people just get together in a pretty location, or even a lousy location, and you go out and you find beautiful photos to take together. And being around other people can really help you, because they'll see something that you perhaps didn't didn't catch your eye, and all of a sudden you're starting to see in different ways because you have more examples. And take, one, one of the, oh, and take a lot of photographs, because trust me, I will take a thousand photographs maybe and have only a few that I like, so keep photographing. Thank you. Yes, and one, one other thing I was going to add to that is um, when in doubt with food, always go in for a close-up. Close-ups like sell the food so much, so you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't really know what you're doing, just get close. get close. That was the most important piece of advice that anyone ever gave me about <laughs> photography stuff just get close thank you ever so much it's at the end of our time today if you have any questions please contact us online grab us here at lunch and we'll be more than happy to talk for the video thank you